And so I'll, I'll, I'll start off by uh, introducing our, our crew here. Um, first off, in, in order that they are appearing on my screen, uh, we have uh, Phil Rossetti. Um, Phil joined uh, the R Street team just about a, a little over a year ago now. Uh, he was on the House Select Committee on Climate Crisis um, and was the Director of uh, Energy at the American Action Forum prior to that. And so uh, think about Phil as just our uh, climate dude here at R Street now. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be throwing the, the tough uh, questions in that bin at him. Uh, and then next up, we have uh, Josiah Neely. Uh, Josiah is uh, based out of Austin. Um, he's been with our energy and environment team for, boy, how long, Josiah? Six years? Seven years now. Seven years. OK, sorry, I undercounted. Um, and so he's uh, really plugged in particular to a lot of uh, the state policy domain within the energy and environment space. Um, which is uh, you know, going to be particularly important to today's topic when we start digging into where we've actually seen the most activity over the last decade. And then um, because today's going to get into a lot of regulatory weeds, um, I'll, I'll introduce uh, Jenny Chen. Uh, Jenny's been a, a senior fellow with us uh, for the past year and really focuses on a lot of uh, electric uh, transmission and market design issues. And especially as a lot of the dialogue on the, the clean transition and climate is um, uses a very like grid first type of mentality. Um, we really want to uh, set up that conversation to, to kind of dig into those weeds. Um, and so Jenny's got a, a, a great background. Um, she used to be a researcher at Duke University. She's worked for uh, Sustainable FERC, which is a project of NRDC. Um, she was in uh, the general counsel's office at FERC, um, and she's uh, uh, actively working, uh, kind of wearing multiple hats um, in, in the energy uh, industry uh, today. So uh, thanks for, for joining us, Jenny. All right, and now to dig in here. So we thought we would um, have this dialogue here today because we're sort of at an interesting juncture in the clean energy and climate conversation. Um, of course, the past year has been largely marked by um, a lot of the clean energy and climate movement very focused on federal action with the anticipation of more of a large spending type of vehicle um, that would be heavily done on a more uh, partisan basis. Um, and now we're at a juncture where we've actually been able to see where the scope of congressional reform is probably limited to. Um, we don't know where ultimately um, everything will go with this Congress, but through developments with Build Back Better and the infrastructure bill um, and understanding the scope of reconciliation, we do have a better sense of, of the nature of reforms that are going to be or likely to be enacted. And so um, that gives us a really interesting prompt to, to think about the future of, um, of congressional uh, and federal policy going forward. And at the same time, at the, um, at the global level, uh, last week was um, the, uh, the Conference of Parties meeting on, on international climate negotiations. And so uh, we really have this interesting um, and timely uh, you know, point to kind of have a debrief from that conversation. And then, um, you know, as promised, we're also going to kind of work down today from sort of the international level to national to then talking about like what we're doing more locally. And I, I think when we put in context of what we've seen over the last decade and where we could be going in the future, um, the role of states is going to take sort of a renewed interest um, in this uh, climate clean energy conversation going forward. So um, without further ado, I will uh, start off at the global level. Uh, as we always like to say, uh, it's important to remember that climate change is a global problem and is a function of global emissions patterns. And so uh, with that, I'm gonna put the, uh, the first question in uh, to Phil here. Um, you know, Phil, what are your takeaways from the Conference of Parties uh, last week, and especially in the context of global emissions trends and how well these conversations sort of align with strategic international cooperation principles? Yeah, thanks, Devin. That's a great question. Uh, you know, overall, my impressions of the COP uh, you know, is that there's a lot of uh, expressed ambition. I think it's, uh, it's a good takeaway that we do see a lot of countries re recognizing this need to do more 
they're making very commitments. They're signing on to sort of new deals where they want to phase down coal and fossil fuels. Uh, so that level of ambition is good. And the you know the biggest takeaway probably is that there's a, a new design for carbon offsets and, and sort of these international schemes for trading these offsets across borders. Uh, this had you know kind of mixed reaction from a lot of people because it also includes uh, a lot of the rules from the old regime, which uh, were unsatisfactory to a lot of uh, folks for the you know, sort of verification and the additionality and, and other concerns. Uh, so I'd say, you know, there's heightened ambition, but it's still not really all the way there or, you know, going to be everything that uh, is needed to get to you know, sort of a global net zero target or these, um, uh, these climate targets that people strive for. In terms of the sort of international context, though, what's important to keep in mind is there's a big divorce between the rhetoric and the actual data. So we look at the data of global emissions, uh, you know, it's still going up. The pandemic kind of gave us a reprieve and they went, you know, a little bit below expectations, uh, but global fossil fuel usage is still high. Uh, it's higher than it was 10 years ago. It's essentially right where we expected that it would be. And even as we've had this surging renewables uh, and alternative energy adoption globally, that hasn't been met with a commensurate decline of fossil fuels. So getting to this kind of international paradigm of everyone uh, facing down their emissions is going to go beyond these sort of agreements and this sort of uh, recognition of renewables or, or other energy expansion, uh, and, and something's kind of missing there. We look at international agreements and what tends to be successful is kind of this marriage of all these different issues into a, a way that harmonizes and people can say, okay, you know, we'll make a concession on this issue to get uh, you know where we want on that issue. And that's what's really been missing, missing from the climate uh, discussion so far. Uh, the prevailing strategy has often been, oh, you know, the U.S. needs to lead. If we lead, the rest of the world will follow. Uh, and that this kind of idea of international norms and us studying the norms and everyone just kind of falling into it. And we look at big international issues like nuclear nonproliferation or human rights. Uh, usually it's not just the establishment of norms, but also the inclusion of uh, these countries into uh, economic and national security agreements where we're saying, okay, you know, if you want to be part and parcel of these deals, you also have to uh, be you know, in line with our expectations and norms. And one kind of last thing to keep in mind that is uh, the data shows that the U.S. is actually leading. You know, we have reduced our emissions since 2005, essentially more than every other developed nation combined. Uh, our emissions trajectory and emission uh, intensity improvement is actually better than most of our peers. Uh, and so the, this sort of a global leadership isn't really getting recognized, which is a big mismatch between the perceptions and the reality. Uh, so getting a good climate strategy involves getting those uh, perceptions more in line with the reality and getting firm commitments from the big emitters. Yeah, thanks. That's a that's a fantastic overview, and and it's sort of a a, a sense of of optimism on the home front, but um, a little bit of concern on the international front, which is, of course, where the rubber really hits the road. Um, I really liked your emphasis, Phil, on talking about the gulf sort of between the rhetoric and where the data is right now, um, because this is largely why we wanted to have today's conversation, too, is not that it's only timely, but because what we're seeing with like sort of the broad higher level narrative doesn't always match what we're seeing in terms of where we're seeing results in the field. And so pulling this down from international to the national level, I'm gonna turn it over to Jenny um, to really dig into sort of the, the implications of some congressional developments, uh, which have taken a, a more outsized focus on the electric industry. So Jenny, maybe just run us through here, um, like the extent that recent, recent congressional activity, um, you know, addresses these infrastructure impediments to clean energy development. That's a really good question. Um, so I think a lot of us in the industry have been talking about the need to modernize the transmission system as a resource mix and as demand patterns change. We know that electrification is on the horizon. And at the same time, there is extreme weather events that poses um, new threats to, um, to the uh, transmission as well as distribution and, um, and generation fleet. Um, so th that needs to be taken into account as well. Um, but the challenges to building transmission, um, particularly the types of transmission that we need to move um, emissions-free, um, low-cost resources to demand centers, um, so usually long-line transmission, um, 
is uh, is at least threefold. So there is the planning. Um, there's the planning aspect, getting the right type of pl uh, transmission planned, as well as who pays for that transmission. So uh, we call it cost allocation. Um, and then there's the siting and permitting um, challenges to transmission. Um, of these three, um, planning is probably the most important because it's the first step. And having good, inclusive, and transmission and transparent planning um, that enables stakeholders to test out different alternatives and understand the benefits of these projects to them uh, could result in fewer um, fights over uh, who pays for the transmission as well as siting down the road. Um, but the issue today with planning is that it's more of a bottoms up local first black box approach. So most of the transmission projects we're getting are local upgrades. Um, these add up to be about $20 billion a year. And um, they don't go through as much regulatory review, if any, and they are charged to customers um, who pay the cost and then shareholders get a return on these, um, these investments. So even though we are, um, we are seeing a decline in wholesale electricity prices, um, you know, the markets are, are helping us save um, in terms of um, uh, the energy markets are helping us save on the wholesale level. We are seeing more capital expenditures that are bringing um, end use customer um, rates um, back up or at least leveling off. Um, so this is particularly the case where, um, where in, in regions where competition is more limited, um, partic particularly a competition over um, transmission build is limited, and we can't really discipline the types of spending that goes on there. Um, so from that, um, we can see that the problem is not the lack of capital, but it's really the allocation of capital. What types of projects are, are getting that capital and, and being, um, being built? So when we look at the different types of policy tools that are available, and we're relying on spending because that that tends to be something easier um, for us to get through in this political environment. Um, that spending needs to be directed, um, as directed as, as possible to achieve policy outcomes. So the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act does have a lot of good provisions that could facilitate uh, planning, siting, and paying for transmission. Um, the siting provision is is the, uh, I think the one that stands out as the one that doesn't necessarily rely on um, spending as a primary vehicle. There is an update to, um, to a backstop siting provision um, from EPACT. And what it does is it clarifies, it adds criteria to the designation of um, critical transmission corridors um, to, to include um, um, uh, corridors that could connect intermittent resources or renewables resources. Um, and it also clarifies when federal entities can issue construction permits, <clears throat> even when states do not do so. Um, so, so there is a backstop siting provision in the, um, in the EJA. Um, most of the rest of the infrastructure bill on transmission and all of the Build Back Better um, is on spending. There's a very important um, spending provision in Build Back Better, which is 10 million for um, DOE to assist in planning. Um, so technical um, assistance to stakeholders, convening stakeholders, um, getting their buy-in and helping them see um, different alternatives and, and the benefits to their jurisdictions of um, these transmission projects. Um, so that one, that one is pretty important. Um, there is also various other provisions, siting assistance provisions that are very helpful as well. Um, and then for most of the various provisions, DOE can help determine how the spending is allocated. So um, DOE, Office of Electricity, will have to staff up. And, um, and I'm optimistic that DOE will be able to help um, budget out these expenditures well. Um, there's also another provision that's very important um, because we know that in addition to building the infrastructure that we need and also maximizing the efficiency of the infrastructure that we have, um, organized wholesale electricity markets can help us optimize um, infrastructure and how we uh, flow electricity over that system. So there's $40 million to the Department of Energy 
to help states understand um, through technical assistance um, and modeling, um, but help them understand um, how these markets might benefit them. So I'll, uh, I'll pause there and, and see if um, you have any follow-up questions, but you might also want to um, uh, go on to the next topic as well. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. That's a, that's a great snapshot on what's going on in the Hill right now and how, to, how it sort of fits into the, the ecosystem of, of um, a lot of barriers to the, the clean transition. Um, and we'll follow up with, uh, with a, another round of questions here that, uh, that get into the weeds. Um, before I move over to uh, Josiah here, I did want to um, uh, flag uh, one thing that's um, this, uh, this recording will be archived. So for those of you that may have to bounce or want to share it with a colleague, don't worry, it'll, it'll be up there. Um, so you can access it at, at, at any time. Um, and then uh, a couple of the specific questions that have started popping up, please feel free to put those in. And um, some of these we're actually going to fold out into the next round of questions um, before we even open it up to, to just more general Q&A. Um, so to kind of take it from the congressional level um, and now move it down even lower to the state level, um, I'm going to turn it over to Josiah to kind of give us the uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the lowdown on what state trends have affected uh, clean energy deployment and, and uh, emissions uh, profiles. Yeah, it's like one of those Russian dolls, right? First we're doing international, then national, and then I'm like the smallest doll. Or, um, yeah, so I think one thing that we have seen uh, historically is that whenever uh, there is some perceived uh, resolution or lack of resolution at the congressional level in terms of cli uh, climate, a lot of that energy then moves to state and local level. So uh, a good example of this was in the Trump administration when Trump said that they were gonna, the US was withdrawing from the uh, Paris Agreement. You saw lots of states and cities and businesses, you know, they say, well, we're still in, we're gonna do all this, uh, we have all these programs and targets of things we're going to do to reduce uh, emissions, stay on track. Uh, you saw something uh, similar after the failure of Waxman Markey back in 2009. There was a, a renewed focus on, okay, well, let's, well, you know, what, if we can't get something through uh, Congress, what can we get through blue states, uh, cities, other places like that? I, I expect that after the resolution of Build Back Better, whatever happens with that, whatever form, that you're probably gonna see uh, something like that again. So in terms of the policies, probably the, uh, the biggest, the signature policy that a lot of places pursued were RPSs, Renewable Portfolio Standards, trying to encourage development of clean energy in that way. Uh, more recently, uh, you've seen, uh, you know, more comprehensive net zero plans, targets, other things like that. There were some states, uh, particularly California and in the Northeast, that had uh, some emissions trading programs that they've set up. Um, the effectiveness of that somewhat hampered by RPS, uh, in fact, um, uh, but that's out there. Uh, and then, interestingly, I think it, it's something that is worth noting is, you know, if you look at the actual deployment of clean energy and even uh, emissions reductions, uh, a significant factor is not even policy driven per se, it's market driven. Uh, so, you know, uh, Phil did mention that the U.S. was a leader in emissions reduction. That wasn't because we passed Waxman-Markey. It wasn't because of the clean power plant and all that stuff. You know, the uh, if you go back decades, the biggest thing was just the sw switch over from coal to natural gas. More recently, uh, you've seen a bigger emissions uh, reduction driver coming from clean energy, from renewable energy. But the interesting thing even there is that if you look, um, you know, it's estimated that uh, over the last two decades, about half of that renewable energy deployment was due to RPS, the other half not due to RPS. And if you look going forward over the next decade, that's expected to fall to a third, right? So two thirds, not due to the RPS, most of it, and increasingly as, the, uh, as it's resulting in emissions reductions, increasingly that's due to market forces, to uh, you know, falls in the prices of these products, they become more competitive and they have uh, uh, markets that are available to them both on the supply side and on the demand side 
because you do see a lot of growing demand for clean or green energy from consumers, both residential and especially in the corporate world, which we can talk about more. Um, so I just want to I just want to flag that out there that you know if we're talking about the 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 dolls, you know the 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 smallest doll is actually also the biggest doll, in, uh, which is the market individual choice. Um, so anyway, uh, I think I'll turn it back over to Devin if you want to go to the next round. But yeah, that's 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 great, Josiah. Thank you, and I I think that the effectiveness of decentralized forces that is what's market driven and what's been state and local government driven what we've learned over the last decade is right that, that that's been the dominant driver of why we've been we've been seeing declining emissions and in fact it's exceeded the emissions expectation targets of both the clean power plan and wax and marquee as you noted too so it's really interesting to see that we've sort of had this unforeseen success <laughs> um in in a lot of uh uh, you know, the, the developments of the last decade here, uh, at least on a home front. And going forward, I think there's a couple things I really wanted to connect the dots on. One is Jenny made an interesting point that you're not really seeing a lack of motivated capital in, in the transmission domain, at least, and a couple other um, specific industry segments. And then Josiah kind of noted on the clean energy or the generation side that actually private demand is outstripping even all the RPS. And keep in mind that a lot of these states now are, are already kind of have saturated their policy arena with 100% RPS. And yet still we're looking at, um, a, a, in particular, like corporate demand for clean energy deals is going to outpace RPS, it looks like. Um, and so that naturally gets us into this question of saying like, wow, what is motivating the, the, the market to be so aggressive on this front, you know, is it is it as simple as just uh, technological advances have made clean energy so cheap <laughs> um, that you know that they were going to do this stuff anyways, and now you know the, the the corporate PR office just wants to take credit for it. Well, I can't say that that obviously advances in technology certainly provided a nice tailwind for a lot of the behavior that we're seeing, but. It's when you kind of lift up the hood on this stuff, it's pretty clear that there's something else going on. There's some other forms of additional motivations behind this. And when you talk to the business community and you figure out like what are the pressures on them, what's driving everything from their their, their public targets on, on environmental uh, sustainability to specific procurement behaviors, et cetera, um, a lot of this stuff actually stems from a combination of different factors, whether it's uh, reputational risk and enhancement, right? As we see in the NGO community, get a bit more focused on actually driving uh, corporate behavior without sort of um, the, the lens of policy reform. But then you're also seeing uh, firms come into the space for, you know, motivated by human capital attraction and retention. Um, a lot of investor pressures, of course, especially in certain industries. Uh, and the list kind of goes on and we're still really dissecting what a lot of those drivers are and what their full implications are. But it does show that right now, there's really no lack of private capital, especially to hit a lot of these interim um, re reduction target goals in the aggregate. So that necessarily points us to the question of, well, what are, if the private sector is really motivated for this on top of very ambitious, a, a set of ambitious state policies, where are the binding constraints? in the clean transition. And this naturally is gonna get us into a conversation on digging into some of the regulatory weeds. And uh, I see we had a question here on some land use and NEPA questions, and that really sets up the, the next one that I'm gonna punt over to Phil, which is or in context of what we've seen of these drivers, but also where we're starting to see the, the true constraints of clean capital deployment management. Um, how does this feed into sort of a refreshed approach to, to national climate policy? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so one thing that I think we have to kind of frame these sort of uh, discussions about emissions and climate change is we can't separate the domestic lens from the global lens. And I think there's a real temptation amongst all of us to kind of look at the guidelines and the uh, scenarios that are laid out where they basically say, okay, the U.S. gets to, you know, net zero emissions by 2050 or some such, and then assuming that the rest of the world does the same, uh, that we're going to resolve climate change in that manner. And that's not really what we see as driving emissions reductions, either in the United States or globally. 
uh, really what we see as bring down emissions is the sort of innovation. Uh, and you know, natural gas is kind of mentioned as a big driver of emissions reduction in the US. Uh, that wasn't something that just happened. Uh, that was part of a concerted innovation effort going back to the energy crises of the 1970s. And this idea we were going to you know, invest in a, a whole array of different technologies and hope that you know, something would bear fruit. And we got that in the form of directional drilling technology. That wasn't a climate effort, that was just a general sort of ener energy innovation effort. Uh, that is a better example of what drives uh, global emissions reductions and when we think about the regulatory approach and how this fits into it, we really see this impasse in a lot of thinking, which is a lot of folks kind of take this approach of, okay, we need to set mandates, new regulatory targets, you know, just tighten the screws as much as we can on the regulation. And that's going to force this uh, removal from the market of these uh, you know, dirtier polluting technologies. Uh, but what we actually see is that that's not how it plays out. Uh, usually a strong you know, regulatory regime can have adverse consequences because the entities that are going to be able to survive and endure those harsh regulations are the incumbents who already are equipped to, uh, to manage it. And very often there's a lot of political backlash against uh, anything that would be like not technologically feasible or too high cost. Uh, the Clean Power Plan is kind of a good example where it was, you know, essentially would have uh, required a big phase down of coal uh, but it got tossed out by the Supreme Court as, you know, th this might not even be within the confines of what's uh, appropriate for a regulator to do. As a side note, we actually beat the clean power plant targets, you know, like a decade ahead of schedule, but that's uh, for other reasons. Uh, now, when we think about what sort of regulatory approach is actually conducive to reducing emissions, uh, the better sort of answer is these, this unlocking of innovation, this understanding that it's not uh, some sort of idea of just taking the same energy resource we have now and rearranging them in a way that's going to get us to net zero emissions, but more about how do we allow for new innovation, new market entrants to outcompete the incumbents that are the emitters. In this sense, when we look at NEPA, this is, has been a big barrier to a lot of new energy deployment because citing things like transmission lines, where you can actually get energy from some, you know, some place where you have wind or solar availability to the areas where it's needed, NEPA can be a big impediment to that. Uh, when we look at the actual number of clean energy or conservation projects that are in the NEPA pipeline, more than half of the, or sorry, not more, um, about a, let's say I'm talking about about a third these projects are related to clean energy, uh, but that's you know much more than we see related to fossil fuel projects. Most of the fossil fuel projects have to go through NEPA get categorical exclusions. So we start to look at the top echelon projects that require in environmental impact statements. They're they're mostly uh, clean energy related. Getting a better you know, streamline for these new projects, cleaner projects, actually navigate regulation, actually is going to unlock innovation and reduce our emissions. Beyond that, we also see a lot of other regulations like new source review, uh, you know, tax code, you know, can be very uh, difficult for new technologies, new market entrants to navigate effectively. And as a result, the regulations can end up harming our environmental progress rather than helping it. So we need to keep that lens uh, in, in view. Thanks, Phil. That's, that's really helpful. And one thing I think the theme we keep pumping back into is just we're seeing the state of technology and the private appetite for the, a clean transition just kind of motivating so much interest in new investment that is going to displace, um, you know, legacy assets that have a, 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 you know, a dirtier emissions profile. And so that really means that the policy conversation kind of needs to shift to this focus on how do we reduce barriers to capital stock turnover? And a lot of that isn't even in the domain of conventional environmental policy instruments, right? It could be like you noted, uh, you know, tax reform. Um, it could be elements of, uh, um, of, of permitting, um, whether that's environmental permitting or other forms of permitting, right? When you look at things like the soft cost of solar technologies, which are so high in this country in large part because a lot of our, um, you know, building, um, you know, uh, code permitting processes are, are, are really cost additive. And so when we start kind of dissecting that domain, 
it, it really means that maybe we need to start thinking more surgically about what those barriers to, to, to new entry and capital stock turnover are. And one domain that that's very pervasive in is, you know, to bring this back to electricity and next question goes to Jenny here, um, to kind of tee those up, what are, what are some additional actions that Congress, um, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, uh, DOE, and, and others could, could pursue to reduce barriers to, to clean resources um, in a way especially that enhances economic activity and benefits consumers? Yeah, um, thanks, Devin. And I, I think those three actors, DOE, FERC, and Congress, are all very important here. Um, FERC does have a lot of authority that it could use to um, reduce some of these barriers. Um, oftentimes, however, FERC does self-police a lot, and um, so having some cover from Congress can help. So, you know, one example could be, um, so FERC tends to move in an incremental fashion, first requiring regional planning, maybe it'll require inter-regional plannings um, in, in this next go around, um, in its next reform. Um, for, for transmission. And, um, and then the question is, okay, like if we have interconnections where there are three interconnections, the Western, Eastern, and Texas interconnections, where they're all in sync, they're operating on the same frequency and phase, um, how do we do a better job sharing resources across entire interconnections or, or nationwide? Um, so there is the question of, well, when do we get to interconnection-wide planning? Or, and do we want to go even further to nationwide planning and look at how we can optimize infrastructure um, on a much larger scale and um, be able to move um, emissions-free, low-cost resources where they're abundant to um, places where people are using a, lo a lot of electricity? So certainly advancing planning beyond what's been contemplated now in a stepwise fashion um, could be very helpful. So FERC has some authority to do that. It's doing it incrementally. Congress could provide cover to, um, and um, expediency, in part expediency, to um, uh, direct FERC um, to go a little bit, um, to look broader. Um, Congress can also um, uh, help by um, directing DOE to do certain things, or, or DOE could, um, on its own initiative, do certain things given that it is getting some funding from Congress. So another option would be DOE could act as some, as some kind of independent transmission planner, um, convene stakeholders, state stakeholders and of all types, um, help them understand like what's going into these models, um, provide technical assistance, help them understand the benefits to, the, to their jurisdictions, and essentially help get that buy-in um, that we really need because ultimately um, states, customers, they need to agree to pay for uh, these projects and allocate these costs to their, their rate payers. Um, states are gonna need to agree to site these projects. I mean, we've seen states refuse to site projects where they see that um, certain transmission projects bring up costs to their states. Um, so, so I think um, this planning on a larger scale could be very helpful and DOE, Congress and FERC can all play a role in that. Um, we also mentioned, um, well, maybe we, we mentioned uh, money for um, citing, um, uh, for uh, planning assistance. FERC does have a very interesting uh, um, proposal in its latest reform. Um, uh, I guess it's the, uh, we call it the ANOPER, the Advanced Proposed, uh, the Advanced Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. So it's got an interesting proposal for an independent transmission monitor. Um, Congress could help fund such entities if, um, if they're not otherwise funded through, um, through RTO tariffs, for example. Um, and so they can definitely help open up the black boxes of transmission planning, um, regardless of um, what scale they're occurring on. So a lot of these supplemental local projects and upgrades that are sucking up all the capital, um, these independent transmission monitors could help um, um, evaluate these projects and see if they're really the best use of um, customer resources. So another issue that the uh, this FERC um, ANOPER is is going to try and tackle is the interconnection queue reform um, issue. And um, okay, those are confusing words, but essentially the way that we connect up um, resources, energy resources is based off of our traditional notion that we have large central power plants and they need to figure out how to connect to the transmission system. 
But when you have a lot of smaller um, distributed resources or renewable resources that, you know, there are more of them than um, popping up than, than, you know, you'd, you'd build if you were considering like nuclear plants or um, natural gas and coal plants. Um, you have to fundamentally rethink the way that you interconnect these resources to the grid. So um, right now there's a big backlog of resources trying to interconnect to the transmission system. And, um, and part of the problem is the process and the way that we study how they can connect. So inverting that process, potentially requiring transmission owners or grid operators to provide information to these resources that want to interconnect and tell them, look here, you know, where are all the places um, that would make sense for you to, to build and try to connect to the system, rather for them to try and guess where they need to go and then apply and then finding out that, you know, there's, there's a really high cost connecting at this particular spot um, could be a way to tackle that issue. Um, so that could be done through FERC. It is a big change from how it currently does things um, in, in interconnection. Um, there's a good question on siting that came through and certainly siting is still a thorny issue. Um, there is, I mean, and siting for transmissions a little bit more complicated because long line transmission oftentimes run through multiple states. Sometimes there are uh, so-called flyover states where the transmission line might not um, um, deliver or pick up power. Um, so, so if we want to track what's really going on and what's holding up the process, something like a siting permitting dashboard, um, a little bit like the FAST 41 um, permitting dashboard, um, but that covers more projects. Um, and also covers approvals at the state and local level could be really helpful. So, you know, for example, um, one of our audience members asked about the West. Um, you know, some states require siting decisions on the county level. And so making sure that we stack up all of these approvals um, concurrently rather than sequentially could help save on um, that time that requires, um, that it takes to, uh, to permit and site, um, site these lines. And you know, just looking at the FAST 41 permitting dashboard, it does seem like NEPA maybe takes like um, three to five to you know, maybe seven years at most for very large projects. So the question is, all right, what else is going on? Um, so having a tool like that to really diagnose and make transparent actions, um, the actions and the actors that are holding up these processes, I think could be very helpful. Um, there are also some really great mapping tools that if we brought earlier into the planning process could help inform better plans that avoided um, uh, going through regions that we know are of a higher siting risk. So um, that is another area where we can improve upon. So, so a lot of times it does come back to planning. Um, I'll leave it at that and uh, I'll let you go on to the next topic. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jenny. And to, to really elevate the problem statement of the issues that, that Jenny talked about here, um, for example, there's a good Lawrence Berkeley study on that interconnection process. Um, the most recent one that came out looked at um, the result of that process is that right now you're looking at, an, uh, at enough generation sitting in interconnection queues in just a, not even fully nationwide, but just in a, in a handful of areas that is over 70% of the existing capacity on the electric system. So you wanna talk about a bottleneck. And then what they've seen is that over in recent years, you're, you're, you're seeing um, multiple years of additional delay. Um, you're seeing all sorts of informational, procedural and financial barriers to entry through a lot of those domains. So um, that is teed up in FERC's a and and as is the transmission issue, um, where you sit there and you look at this and you say like, holy, holy cow, all the planning and cost allocation issues, like that's ultimately gonna decide whether we double or triple, um, you know, the, the transmission capability on the system, right? And, and that along with some siting considerations, right? Um, and that ultimately is what a lot of these studies say is gonna be necessary if you're gonna have any chance of, of satiating all of this, uh, especially renewable energy demand going forward. So in many regards, things like the ANOPER, which I know some folks may not have been aware of before this call, 
that's honestly more important <laughs> than almost anything we've seen sort of legislatively get any attention. Um, and so this regulatory minutia is, is really important moving forward. Um, but to, uh, to, to go back now to um, some, some uh, elements in the state domain too, and then we'll open it up to, to Q&A. There's of course a lot of things in the regulatory arena that states can do as well as I think the prospects for legislative reform are probably a little bit better <laughs> in various states. Um, and so for, for more on this, I'm just gonna give an open-ended question to Josiah here on what do you see as like things that red states and blue states in particular can, can, can do to sort of exercise clean energy and, and climate leadership uh, moving forward? Yeah, so I would say, you know, there's a couple things. The, the main thing I would say is you wanna double down on what's working. Uh, and as is noted, you know, market forces are pushing clean energy resources. The demand is outstripping the supply. Um, and, you know, uh, I think when you're pressing down on the accelerator in your car and the car is not moving, you know, it's probably the problem is not, probably not the pedal. Right. So uh, there are a couple of things. One thing that's been mentioned is about uh wholesale energy markets. There are a number of states. So certainly there are regions in the US and the Southeast and in the West that are not part of an RTO or any sort of organized wholesale market. And we have seen recently a number of states that are not in any whole, uh, organized wholesale market decide they wanted to join one or at least look into it. South Carolina, uh, Colorado, Nevada, you know, so th they, I think, see the, uh, the benefits of that. Uh, primarily in terms of uh, consumer savings, but there is, I think, a clean energy advantage there to being part of that larger uh, geographic market. It helps if you're trying to integrate uh, renewable or intermittent resources uh, into your grid. Similarly, on the on the retail side, I know uh, in Arizona, for example, uh, there's a company, Green Mountain Power, that's trying to get into uh, access retail choice so they can sell a 100% clean energy product. That's stuff like that's going on in other states. So uh, those are definitely some options. Uh, in terms of, you know, states that already have a, an RPS, they might want to consider uh, how to update or reform that to include some of these newer resources and technologies that may not be eligible for the RPS currently. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, a ton of, of carbon uh, removed or mitigated is the same, you know, regardless of how that's done. If that's if that's done, you know, uh, uh, through through wind or if it's done through batteries or if it's done through energy efficient, like it doesn't matter how it's done. So it's all the same. So that's another thing uh, that I that I think they should look at. Uh, and you know, I'm sure there's a lot more stuff too. But uh, uh, I see Devin. Devin is nodding, and we have some questions. So uh, yeah, let's move on to that. Sure, absolutely. I think that's that's great. And we have a lot to build off of. Um, um, I, I do want to get to a couple of the questions we have in here. I think two of them kind of go together. Um, the the one on NEPA, I think we've pretty well addressed. Um, but there was a specific question also about like if you see more of like this we call like an RT regional transmission organization or what Jenny was kind of talking to about like how these organized markets do transmission planning and interregional work, um, which are some big questions um, in, in developments out west. How much of that would actually drive the transmission <laughs> development alone, as opposed to um, uh, you know addressing a lot of the permitting and siting issues? And I I, I think honestly, uh, Jenny, jump in here. But um, you know my my sense is that we know for sure that NEPA, especially out west, um, will will sometimes actually just outright kill transmission development projects, even for just like consideration of one type of ecosystem impact. Um, and in other cases, the, some of the projects that do survive have, um, you know, been delayed like two, three, four, five years sometimes uh, to, to, to get a permit. Um, but I'd be curious, Jen, if you had any thoughts on sort of like the relative importance of permitting and siting as opposed to um, the, the, the RTO development, um, which is usually associated with more robust transmission planning. Um, I think the issue right now is that long projects are just not really being planned. Um, so we're not seeing a lot of action. I mean, if you don't plan a lot of these long line projects, then um, then uh, 
they, that's the first step. So <laughs> we're going to go from there. Um, so I think um, in the planning phase, definitely there are tools, um, open source um, GIS tools that can identify areas that are um, sensitive environmental areas, cultural heritage sites. You could probably lay around environmental justice um, communities too. Um, but using these tools earlier on can help us avoid some of these siting challenges down the road. Um, but, um, but, but yes, I mean, I think NEPA reform is, it's, I, I, a lot of people would, uh, would, um, could, could have a different opinion about this, but I think it's difficult. I think, um, environmental groups are very interested in retaining NEPA. And um, a lot of people who work with NEPA, um, they understand, um, you know, they they know how how to do it, and they know how to do it um, in a way that you know they they say, look, if you disturb this process, um, we already have a system going here, so um, so it might you know maybe it'll take a longer time. So um, so that that's what I hear when when um, when people talk about NEPA reforms. Yeah, I think um, NEPA, and it's of course not just NEPA. There's also some uh, challenges with uh, implementation of Endangered Species Act and Section 401 permits under the Clean Water Act. Um, a lot of these linear projects, um, ironically, a lot of the stuff that makes pipelines difficult to build also makes transmission very difficult to build. <laughs> um, and so uh, I put in a link um, to a paper that, that Phil did on um, NEPA reform. Uh, it's some stuff that we've done some work on to just kind of, there's a lot of ways that you can go about kind of surgically addressing some of these um, that can retain um, environmental protections and reviews while, you know, reducing things like excessive legal risk or um, duplicative reviews that sometimes add a year or two to the process. So there's, there's sort of like a safe space <laughs> for touching these things, I think, from just a pure environmental perspective. Um, but I do recognize that a lot of times the uh, environmental community gets so worried that once you open up something like that statue up for, for surgery, uh, you could you know, lose control of the process. But it's, uh, it's increasingly becoming obvious that it's a conversation we need to have um, for that and some other statutes. But um, that'll, that'll set us up for, for some uh, hopefully an unholy coalition uh, going forward to, to explore that topic. Um, but I do want to address... Um, uh, and maybe we can come back to, to that um, uh, if we don't get any additional questions. But I did want to uh, combine two questions here. And one is uh, from Ken Richards and then our, our anonymous attendee. Um, you know, one kind of noted that a big driver of the past emissions reductions was natural gas displacing coal. And then the other is kind of talking about like, I think a little bit more down the road, thinking about like what are sort of the, the, the limits of going from fossil to renewables in the absence of energy storage. Um, so two, one big theme that comes to mind here is that the, uh, there was a lot of happenstance, certainly, and sort of um, natural gas having a lower emissions footprint and then the price falling and, and, and effectively your abatement costs were very low, if not negative in some cases. And so the, the, what we did see is parts of the country where you have liberalized electricity markets, they started gobbling this up. Um, because a lot of new entry, this case in the form of natural gas, said, whoa, like we want to do this, boom, displace the legacy assets, the economics of it are good, and it just so happens that new entry drives environmental improvement. That's an important lesson learned, because in areas that kind of retained cost of service generation more, you kind of saw these entities sitting there and saying like, hey, can I put a billion dollars into a, an old coal plant and that maybe a competitive generator would say like, no, this dog needs to retire. So we saw, we saw that um, have big implications there. I think on the policy side, aside from sort of the market advantage um, of that lesson learned though, we're also seeing that um, you were seeing a substitution of one form of conventional power generation for another. And the natural gas to coal substitution uh, or sorry, coal to natural gas substitution might be a better analogy for the, the grid of the future if we were going to say, um, you know, nuclear, right? Um, where you have more of a conventional generation profile. But what we actually see is that the economics and some policy drivers are increasingly favoring like imperfect substitutes, right? Um, more weather dependent in use limited resources when solar storage, um, which means that ultimately you really need to have a system of rules in place 
that LUT imperfect substitutes come in cost effectively while maintaining grid reliability. And this is gonna be a real difficult dance on the policy and institutional front. Um, but in my opinion, kind of going forward, and Jenny, stop me if, if you disagree or have an alternative view, I kind of view like the economic role for renewables to the second question as really relegated to just a role player if you don't get the institutional reforms in place. So if you don't get these, these reg barriers addressed, address the equivalency of different imperfect substitution, I don't know that the economics of renewables are gonna be overly favorable in that type of environment. Whereas if you do get the right market-based environment, it looks like the underlying economics could be supportive of them for actually being the backbone <laughs> of our system going forward. So that underscores the importance of having a, a very constructive federal and state regulatory environment that lets a uh, competitive generation flourish in that type of context. Jenny, I don't know if you had any additional ideas on that one or... <laughs> I think I think we lost you on the sound side. Oh, okay. Um, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was I was just agreeing with you, Zevin. Um, definitely um, addressing some of these barriers that are essentially imposing costs on introducing renewables um, to the extent that they, you know, otherwise would be cost competitive. I think could be very helpful. Um, so so yes, and there are definitely ways that we can rethink the grid in terms of. Um, how do we have like a more renewables based system? You know, how do we think about like, um, well, we don't need to get too wonky and engineering here, but there are definitely very smart people thinking about it. And um, it's, it's definitely possible. And these renewables, re renewable resources and um, demand side resources can provide valuable grid services. That's a great point. And, and maybe the other piece of that last question that's interesting too, is you kind of talk about like, what is sort of the potential scenario for, for renewables cost effectively and reliably to be integrated, um, you know, sort of with sort of the storage status quo, right? And I think most of the, the credible studies that we've seen in this space kind of say that you start getting resistance points at very various elements um, under different scenarios, kind of when you get in that 50, 60, 70% renewables integration range, you start getting like like pretty considerable binding constraints. And one thing to the question of storage, um, this is a, an important distinction, I think, between like long duration storage and short duration. So there's a lot of technologies already that can provide a lot of those like small, like kind of like short duration balancing services type role, but the economics are still not yet favorable to sort of having that long duration storage. And I think this kind of puts you in the bin of thinking about a two-part strategy, especially on the grid side. One is get the institutional dynamics correct so that your capital can flow to productive uses for today's technologies that can drive a ton of low-cost decarbonization. And then B, sort of the, going back to a point Phil made, like you need to drive innovation to make sure that the advancement of technology is going to be there to have low abatement costs in the future. It's either, and that's, and that's not just important at home, um, but it's going to be critical abroad, especially for, for countries that are much more cost sensitive um, than the United States is. And so um, I don't know if Phil on the innovation side, you wanted to chime in on this or another point, but it might be a good segue. Yeah, I think, you know, there's just a, a couple of important takeaways. Um, you know, one kind of good example that I often bring up to folks when they think about the innovation kind of global context of emission abatement. Uh, so the OECD sort of GDP per capita is about four times what it is uh, for non-OECD nations, so essentially developed nations versus developing nations. So if you want kind of a quick rule of thumb of if something is really cost feasible in uh, developing nations, just kind of look at the cost difference in the US, multiply that by four, and that can give you kind of a, a better sense of like, oh, this is what it would actually mean for sort of a typical person outside of the US. Uh, to make this transition to technology. So that cost sensitivity is very important. And in that vein, you know, getting back to kind of the earlier questions about sort of the replacement of uh, existing technologies with kind of renewables and storage and these other things, it's important to really get back to the root of basic economic principles, which are scarcity, uh, you know, is, is the primary driver of a lot of economic decisions. And also that there's a lot of heterogeneity among consumers. So when it comes to climate, 
we really kind of gravitate towards this idea of like, oh, we've got this one solution, we've got batteries, or we've got storage, and we're just gonna like amp that up to 11, and that's gonna solve the problem. But the challenge is when we actually look at the economics of that, it's like, okay, well, you need this many mineral resources, uh, that's gonna drive up the price of those resources. Now, all of a sudden, this technology that was cheaper in this scenario, now it's not gonna be cheap uh, in this scenario. And that's why we have to have some humility on our own part as analysts to understand that you know not every consumer is the same. Uh, the technologies that may be cheap today aren't always going to be cheap tomorrow if the inputs uh, increase in cost. And simultaneously, the things that uh, are expensive today, uh, sorry, there's some uh, motorcycles going outside. Uh, the things that are expensive today are going to fall in cost if we have uh, you know, some uh, reduced cost for the inputs or economies of scale or, or whatnot. Uh, so the, the whole climate approach in terms of free market approach is really about understanding about saying the market conditions right, letting these uh, technologies compete on their merits and allowing the best ones to rise to the top. Yeah, and that's a that's a great point. And, and maybe that's a nice way to put a bow on this before we um, you know, wrap up here today is that when we think about the, the pathways of voluntary decarbonization, which have just shown, shown so much progress in recent years and really much more to come, you, you look at this and, and kind of you think everything from like the state level where a lot of consumers, right, to Phil's point, like there's a very different willingness to pay to reduce your footprint, but it's very evident in the aggregate. Um, some, like some of these corporate sustainability leaders, hey, their balance sheet can support it. They're willing to fork out a ton of money. They want to pay a premium for it. Um, whereas then you have a lot of others, um, you know, like, you know, lower income households, a lot of times just are going to have an affordability problem on this. And so you kind of think about like, how do you allocate the green premium in sort of the, the most just way? Well, actually enabling individual choice, um, things like retail choice on, on the electricity side can have a huge um, up, upscale or an upside in terms of like, driving that voluntary decarbonization and making sure that those costs are commensurate with, with what these actors want to pay for it. Um, so that's a, that's a big element of it. And then the other thing that we're, I think, kind of seeing a lot that I wanted to add on to a point Josiah raised on sort of RPS reform is that a lot of what we've seen, especially at the state level, but even with sort of federal you know, spending that's typically very subsidy heavy, is it's been a little bit more oriented towards generic clean energy promotion, either requiring it or in terms of like the director implied subsidies. And a lot of these corporate sustainability leaders now are actually focused on emissions reductions. And a big, a big point of this is they're kind of saying, hey, these generic, you know, renewable energy credit markets, for example, that's not actually like getting me the additional emissions avoided that I want anymore. So we're starting to see a disconnect from sort of like these green industrial policies and actual emissions results. And it's going to be the corporate sustainability drivers is, that are really motivated to reduce their indirect emissions that are calling for some of these types of reforms. And I think a lot of that may tie into uh, in enabling um, sort of a digital space where you can have you know, marginal emissions displacement be very transparent. And then you have the right types of financial products being permitted so that the private sector can really innovate and lower the costs of, of verifiable emissions reductions um, and, and really kind of accelerate like the cost reductions, innovation and um, emissions uh, uh, decline that we're, we're hoping to see. So uh, maybe that'll be a topic for a, for a future date here, but um, I wanna you know, thank everyone who was able to tune in and encourage everyone to, 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 to share the, uh, the archived uh, event with, with anyone that might be interested in sort of the stage of a, of a rethink on, on climate clean energy policy. Uh, and please reach out to us at, at any point. Um, Jenny, Phil, Josiah, uh, thanks again for your participation here and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you all. Thanks everyone.